Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So I'll take you to the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating the application of the KMV model to Royal Bank of Scotland in 2008, that is, in the wake of the global financial crisis. We have already got a video on KMV application to a non-financial company, however, it's quite valuable to reinvestigate KMV on an extreme case, that is, a bank that is in quite severe financial distress. Royal Bank of Scotland, as many banks, did not fare particularly well during the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, and there were quite severe default concerns and uh, financial stability concerns surrounding RBS in 2008. It even had to be bailed out by the UK government. Applying KMV to a bank is quite a bit different to applying KMV to a non-financial company due to different disclosure and adaptation of various disclosure items into the model inputs. And also, and perhaps more importantly, applying a model to an extreme case, that is, a bank in severe financial distress, can shed some more light onto the applicability and limitations of the model, in this case, KMV. Let's start. Here we have got stock prices at month ends throughout 2007 and 2008, and we can see that uh, the performance of Royal Bank of Scotland was not particularly great. Uh, the stock price started at around £41 per share and plunged to £5.32 per share by the end of 2008. And that can allow us to calculate the market capitalization, which is multiplying it by the number of shares outstanding. And we can see that the market value of RBS's equity has dropped from £32 billion to slightly more than £4 billion by the end of 2008. In terms of the fundamental data that goes into the model inputs for KMV, we would need assets, current liabilities, and non-current liabilities. And here, it matters quite a bit that RBS is a bank, as non-financial companies would have quite a straightforward breakdown of liabilities into current and non-current in their balance sheets. For Royal Bank of Scotland, I have downloaded the uh, balance sheet for 2007 and 2008 from their 2008 annual results from this particular link. It is on page 68. And here we can see that Although RBS does report total assets, which is sufficient for KMV estimation, it reports its liabilities quite granularly. So what we need to do? Well, we need to make some assumptions about which of those liability groups go into current liabilities and non-current liabilities to be able to apply the default point formula DPT calculation, which is short-term debt, current liabilities, plus half times the non-current liabilities or long-term debt. And this um, reflects the fact that long-term debt is not as pressing in terms of um, increasing the probability of default than short-term debt that's due quite soon, within 12 months, that is. So here, we'll make the following assumptions. We group deposits by banks, which are quite unstable, customer accounts, which are mostly demand deposits, settlement balances, as well as derivatives into current liabilities, whereas all other liability groups can be classified as non-current. And here, derivatives are a particularly interesting case, as we can see that derivatives liabilities have more than tripled from 2007 until year-end 2008. And this can reflect a very prominent stylized fact with regard to the 2007-2008 global financial crisis regarding the use of derivatives and mainly credit default swaps uh, leading up to the crisis, where banks were excessively relying on credit default swaps to manage their credit risk. And there was quite a bit of over-reliance on um, risk mitigation by credit default swaps, a lot of neglect uh, in terms of counterparty credit risk that credit default swaps were introducing. And please check our video on credit default swaps after you watch this one if you are interested in this particular concept in more detail. However, here we need to estimate the DPT by just adding to the current liabilities we've just calculated using the assumptions I've just mentioned, uh, plus half 
times non-current liabilities for 2007 and 2008. That would allow us to calculate the DPT drift, which is the growth rate in the DPT, which equals around 36.6%. That means that the default point has increased quite a bit, meaning that the liability weight that increases potentially the probability of default of RBS has gone up by a lot during 2008, which is perhaps unsurprising. In terms of our assets, we can see that the assets of RBS have also grown, but not as much as liabilities, which is a troubling sign in terms of, well, forecasting the probability of default. I have also specified the time horizon, which is one year, and inputted risk-free rate at 4%. Now, we could have used uh, RBS's stock prices to estimate the initial uh, volatility figure that then would be corrected to reflect the fact that market value of assets is not the same as market value of equity. And again, that's one of the major foundations of KMV, trying to estimate the unobservable volatility of asset value, which you cannot directly see from market data. And uh, sometimes using implied volatility of uh, the underlying share price can be a good idea. So here we have got a simple implied volatility calculation using proxies. Again, we choose the strike that's as close to the underlying price, basically the center strike. If the underlying price is 5.32, the strike of 5.3 is reasonably close. We choose the maturity, which is as close to the date of interest as possible. So that would be 16th of January 2009, which is the third Friday of January 2009. Again, a conventional expiry date of options is third Friday of each month. And then as we input the call and put prices, the market premium for those options, we can estimate the implied volatility using the following proxy formula. Half of the value of call and put, which is basically half of the value of a straddle. Again, using a straddle in this case allows us to estimate implied volatility more precisely than using just a single option. And then we divide it by the adjustment factor of 0 0.398 times the square root of maturity, which is again just the difference between the maturity date and the current date, which is year-end 2008, divided by 365 as the right 365 days in a year. And if you are interested in this particular implied volatility proxy or calculations of implied volatility using various numerical procedures, please check these videos out. But we just plug in our implied volatility figure here, which is 60%, and we can now proceed to the implementation of the KMV model itself. And here I'll show you a slightly more concise framework for estimating KMV without having to paste the template for each iteration. Traditionally, KMV is estimated in an iterative way where we try to minimize mispricing and then we revise our volatility from the prior estimation by using the volatility of asset growth. So here, we first need to refer to market capitalization over the sample months, just referring to them from the top. Equity returns would just be the uh, market cap at month end divided by market cap at the previous month and minus one. Then we need to input the value of assets and then we allow it to vary to minimize mispricing. So here we'll use the naive assumption that market value equals book value. So here we'll refer to the value of assets at the end of 2007. And then we'll use the asset growth that we have estimated and raise it to the power of one over 12, as we assume that assets grow continuously and smoothly over the year. We can see that we have reached exactly the value that's reported towards the year end here. Again, this would be revised as we allow our model to be calibrated. In terms of the volatility, we we'll just refer to the initial guess that in our case is the implied volatility uh, given the uh, calculation proxy here. And in terms of the default point of DPT, we we'll refer to the DPT at the year end 2007. And then we use the DPT drift to allow it to grow smoothly throughout the year 2008. 
uh, here we explicitly apply the D1 and D2 formulas, which are very similar to those that you use in Black Scholes model for option prices. And again, uh, for a more um, comprehensive uh, explanation of those formula application, please check our original video on KMV out. And this uh, D1 and D2 calculation allows us to um, estimate the fair value of RBS's equity by um, treating it as an implied option on net assets, which is a very common um, Merton uh, model logic where we treat um, a stock as an option on residual asset value of a company at the end of a particular period. And here it is one year down the line. This also allows us to quite naturally estimate the probability of default as uh, some sort of uh, probability that this threshold will not be reached. And then we can calculate mispricing, subtracting the estimated fair value from the observed market cap. And we can see that if we treat um, book value of assets as equal to market value of assets, the KMV model does overestimate the fair value of uh, Royal Bank of Scotland's shares quite a bit. All of those mispricings are negative and quite substantial. And we can calculate total mispricing as a squared sum of those mispricings as we want to estimate um, the fair value as precisely as possible. And then we can calculate asset return by just dividing asset value at the end of the month by the asset value at the end of the previous month minus one. And here obviously as we have assumed continuous asset growth, asset volatility is zero. This would change as we allow our model to be calibrated. So now we go to solver and we minimize our mispricing by changing our unobservable market value of RBS assets. As value of assets cannot be negative, we make our unconstrained variables non-negative, so leave this box ticked and use GRG nonlinear method. That brings mispricing quite a bit down. We can see that the KMV model estimation the first iteration has reduced the value of assets by quite a bit and our mispricings now are quite a lot smaller. However, the volatility of market value of assets at 15.53% is quite a bit different to the initial volatility we assumed. And in the classical implementation of KMV, we would have copied and pasted it for the next iteration, plugged in this volatility and then repeated till convergence. But to make it all applicable in one go, we can simply refer to asset volatility here. And now run solver repeatedly until we converge to a mispricing value of zero. So the model precisely estimates the fair value of uh, RBS's equity and uh, holding volatility of our assets consistent uh, within the model. So we click solve and we can continuously to allow the model to converge to the true value of the parameters. That can take several iterations, so please be patient and wait until the model produces the final result. And the model has finally converged to a value of zero in terms of mispricing, meaning that this particular implementation uh, has precisely modeled the fair value of RBS's equity throughout the year. So each point in time is consistent with what we observed at the market. However, what is surprising is that the volatility of asset growth is very small, just 0.85%. This is quite puzzling, but if we uh, take into account the reason why RBS uh, has encountered those default problems, we can interpret it as those default risks arising from the liability side of the balance sheet and not the asset side of the balance sheet. However, this small figure needs to be taken with a pinch of salt, given how much of an extreme case we are dealing with here. Remember how uh, pressed the RBS management was at the end of 2008 to keep the bank afloat. And if we look at the distance to default and probability of default, given uh, end of 2008 data, we see that the probability of default is extremely high, 64.54%, meaning that within a year, 
RBSs were more likely to go bust than it was to stay float. And that, uh, potentially, means that the regulators were correct to worry about the solvency of RBS and that the bailout perhaps was needed and it protected the interests of both shareholders and the depositors, more importantly, of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And if we remember the uh, liability side uh, still as fact, we can see that this particular increase in derivative liabilities is perhaps the reason why the Royal Bank of Scotland was facing so much trouble and so much pressure in terms of default risk at the end of 2008. And that's all there is for the application of KMV to a very extreme case of a distressed bank, Royal Bank of Scotland in 2008, and what light it sheds onto applicability and limitations of the KMV model in such fringe or extreme cases. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make this any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you'd like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supports on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.